got, I got, I got, I got loyalty, got royalty inside my DNA. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to PL Talk. This week, we have a very exciting PL Talk. We are going even deeper into our, um, maybe we shouldn't call it a dissection of Python. Our, um, <laughs> That's please not. Our very interesting and non-morbid analysis of Python. Um, so for those of you who tuned, tuned into the episode with Joe Gibbs Pollitz, we had started talking about Python, you know, what happens when you run a Python program? Um, how would you characterize the Python semantics? Actually, we didn't get super into how would you characterize the Python semantics and kind of like doing a taxonomy of like what are the elements in Python. So, so Carl Friedrich, if you want to, you know, do a little bit of that, I think, I think that would be fun. Um, and um, yeah, so today we have Carl Friedrich Bolt Tarek. Um, I do not know if I pronounced that whole thing right, but um, he is one of the core developers of PyPy. Uh, it is a JIT compiler for Python, a just-in-time compiler. We can also talk about what that means because in compilers class, the first time I saw a JIT, I was like, that's just an interpreter. Like, you know, what's the difference? So I think, you know, we can talk about all of that. But um, some people say, or I don't know if anybody else has ever said, I say the best way to really understand a language is to write a compiler for it. And so this episode is really just about all of the, the ghoulish intricacies of the language uh, that is Python, which I um, turned 30 a few weeks ago. I didn't realize it was, um, it was quite uh, almost as old as me. Um, and as I age, I will keep saying that 30 is almost as old as me. So you'll have no signal about how old I actually am. <laughs> um, but I'm, but you yeah. You just need to remember when you said it for the first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, but yeah. So for those of you who don't know, PL Talk is a weekly live stream. We're usually three p.m. Pacific. Um, we've uh, we've been doing the last couple at different times to accommodate uh, friends calling in from distant time zones. Carl Friedrich will tell you all about where he's calling in from when he introduces himself. But um, yeah. But as a result, we lose Hongi sometimes. Hongi is the co-host. But um, he's somewhere else right now. I think he has a meeting. Um, and so that is why we try to stick to three most of the time. But then, um, you know, for, for very special people, we'll, we'll switch the time. Um, and yeah, so I am the co-host. I, um, I was previously an academic, like Carl Friedrich is-ish, which you'll explain what you are. Um, and I, um, I left a couple years ago to start a company called Aikida Software. We're doing API observability. So essentially applying all the structure you get in programming languages at the API layer, which surprisingly nobody else is really, really doing. So you will hear more about this someday. Sometimes you will, sometime, at some point you will be the guest. Somebody yeah, else I can be my own guest. Yes. Um, but yeah, cool. We're almost up to 50 viewers. Very exciting. People managed to make it despite the new time. So, Carl Friedrich, do you want to just talk a little bit about who you are, where, which faraway time zone you're calling in from, and how you became one of the core PyPy developers? Yeah, let's do that. So, hi, I'm Carl. Um, I live in Duisburg in, in Germany. It's like the, the, the west, western border of Germany, close to the Netherlands. So that means it's uh, 11 p.m. now, and uh, I should be, I should be sleeping. But, um, but here I am. Um, so I, I teach programming to non-CS majors in Düsseldorf, which is like one city to the south. Uh, I have a, a half-time position there as a sort of external, uh, eternal postdoc. And um, yeah, so I have two small kids that I primarily take care of that are hopefully sleeping now. And um, uh, so my on the research side, I'm mainly interested in the efficient implementation of dynamic programming languages. And I mostly care about Python nowadays, but uh, I've also worked on other languages in the past, like uh, a prolog implementation and a small talk implementation and, and sort of dabbled in other languages. And um, yeah, so um, the project that, that you've been alluding to for, for a while now is, is the project called PyPy, which is a, an open source and research project that I've been working on since a uh, ridiculous 16 years by now. And um, yeah, and, and we are talking, uh, we will be talking about that quite a bit today, I, I assume. Um, 
So yeah, so let's actually defer a little bit uh, to, uh, to talking about what Pipe actually is, but I, I can tell you about uh, how I got into it. So um, uh, when I started, I was actually a, a math major. I, I, I had sort of just started my math undergrad. I was after the third semester and the third semester was really hard and I was really fed up with math and I wanted to do something different. And so I went and um, like uh, at, at the time, PyPy was this sort of hot open source project in the Python community with really good outreach. And so I, I thought it, it might be fun to sort of start working on that. So I did in the semester break and um, started going to these, I mean, they, ha they had these week long hackathons all over Europe. And I, so I started going to a few. Um, and then um, it, I think like 10 months later, I actually dropped out of university to uh, start working for one of the companies that was sort of doing industrial research on PyPy. And um, they had sort of just got funding by the European Union um, to, to do some research on PyPy. And so I started working for them. And then only later I went back to university to actually get some kind of degree and um, then ended up doing a PhD also sort of in the same area. So who, like, what is actually the story of the PyPy project? Because I I'm, I had no clue, I guess, well, given my lack of sense of how long Python's been around, and also the fact that I sometimes write like 2002 on, on, on dates, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I clearly have no sense of time. Um, right. But, you know, who, who, um, who started PyPy? What were the original goals? And, and did they reach them? Um, yeah, that's, that's hard to say. I mean, so, so originally, it was really meant as a sort of I mean, maybe we should start unpacking what, it, what, what the project actually is. So, um, and then the project is called PyPy because it's actually Python written in Python. And um, I mean, that's the, that's the main idea. And it was started by some uh, um, European, main European Python fans on some, some mailing lists saying that um, all, the, like, all the cool series languages are implemented in themselves, like various schemes and schemes and, and small talk and small talk. So we all like Python, we should, we should write Python in itself to, to show that it's possible and to sort of have a small and self-contained um, explanation of how Python works, right? Because obviously the right, the, the right way to explain how a language works is to, to, to like implement it in the language itself. Um, and then, um, yeah, a couple of people that were interested in that idea got together for a week and, and sort of started hacking and um, managed to get a lot of um, the implementation, like, and I mean, after a week they could like do stuff like add one and two, it, it, they, they didn't get super far. Um, but uh, I mean, after that week, they decided that they, they wanted to really seriously start working on the project and then uh, started having these meetings. But um, I mean, it's a pretty expensive hobby to just sort of travel around Europe for, for weeks at a time too. Um, to adding one and together. two <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah sure but then you don't really want to spend the week in a, in a in like a hotel room and, and hack right I mean that's I mean um, so they, they decided to, to really reach all the goals they wanted um, to go for EU funding and um, surprisingly enough they managed to get a pretty big grant of like two million euros or something and and that's that's sort of when I started um, working on um, at the project sort of they had just gotten the money and and the, the EU project was sort of just uh, starting and um so they had funding and they were looking for people to to help join in and so the original goals were ridiculous i mean they 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 had written this eu grant and in order to um in order to make it more likely to be accepted they had sort of packed all the uh, all the uh, impressive sounding uh, hot topics of the day in and from i mean from from today's perspective it was really it was, I mean, they sound ridiculous because it, it, they, I mean, all the hot topics at the time are, are meaningless today. There was stuff like semantic web and constrained, <laughs> constrained logic programming. And I mean, that, that's, that's still kind of around, but semantic web is, is relatively dead. And, and then sort of they discovered that if you promise stuff to the U, you actually have to go do it, which uh, turned out to be a, a bit of a hassle later. Um, yeah, anyway. Okay, yeah, that, I think um, that's... So follow-up question, was, um, was uh, making a just-in-time compiler like one, part of the original goals or did yes. that evolve somehow? So, okay. um, I mean, yeah, there, there are various 
technical bits we need to talk about. But um, so one of the original founders of the project was uh, somebody called Armin Rigo, and he had written the original sort of quote unquote uh, JIT compiler for Python called Psycho. And um, his goal was to sort of um, use PyPy as a research ve vehicle to uh, make a better Psycho. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that was part of the original goal. And, and sort of in the last uh, uh, 10 months of the research project, they actually started on the goal and um, made a little bit of progress. So at the end, they had something that could sort of compile um, arithmetic to um, assembler at runtime and get sort of OK performance. But uh, it also um, turned out that the original idea of how to achieve writing a JIT didn't really scale to um, all of Python. And then um, in, the, in the next years, we sort of uh, came up with uh, new and different ideas uh, of how to JIT compile Python. And that sort of, that's actually what eventually turned into my PhD. So um, as I said, I had to actually go back and do an undergrad and, and like a master's. So that took a while, but then after I was finished with that, um, the, the JIT ideas in PyPy had sort of congealed. And I mean, we've written, I think, five different JITs and, and we're, we're at the fifth JIT and, and we're still using the fifth one. But um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that fifth JIT is the one that we, that, that ended up sort of working okay. And, and that's, that's what I then did uh, my PhD research on. Um, cool. Yeah, someone just said in the chat, wow, that's a lot of JITs. Um, but <laughs> yeah, for a little bit... Some of them are really strange. So. Um, but yeah, for um, just to give a little bit of context, someone, the same person in the chat said PyPy blew their mind when they first heard about it, the idea of a JIT written in, in its own language and for in Python for that matter. So can right. you just talk, give a little bit of context about like why it's, it's pretty crazy to, to write a just-in-time compiler for Python in Python? Yeah. Um... I mean, so it, it's sort of from a traditional point of view, it's completely weird because I mean, most JIT compilers are really written in C or I mean, mostly C++. And that's the same is true for, for interpreters in general. Um, so um, yeah, that, that idea is pretty strange. Um, but sort of in the last couple of years, it, it has become a little bit more accepted that it might be a good idea to really move your um, implementation up a level and, and have a language that has a, a, a little bit more guarantees and a little bit more analyzability because one problem with C is that it's very hard to sort of statically find out anything about your program, right? Because But when these, people think about analyzability, they also don't think about Python. That is true. That is fair. Um, so um, and that, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's also maybe a good point to start talking about a little, a few of the asterisks uh, that I, I mean, the disclaimers that are needed when I say that um, PyPy is written in Python. I mean, it's a Python implementation that's written in Python star, but the, the, the Python that's written in, it's not really the full language. It's basically, it's written in, in a subset of the language. And that subset, subset is um, a language called R Python, restricted Python. And um, I mean, nowadays, somewhat confusingly, it's actually a, a subset of Python 2. So, um, and that means nowadays it should be, it's not really PyPy, it's, uh, Pi three, Pi two, or something. I mean, it's a uh, it's a Python three implementation implemented in a subset of Python two, and that subset subset is chosen in such a way um, uh, that um, you're not allowed to do the really the really strange dynamic things. You, yeah, I mean, yeah. All all your variables have sort of fixed types, and you yeah. use a, a static uh, type reference algorithm to figure out what the types are. And then we, in that way, we, we bootstrap the whole implementation to C. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we take um, you know, the Python implementation that's written in R Python, this restricted subset, and then we analyze all the types. And in the end, we just spit out a huge chunk of C code and pass that to the C compiler. And in that way, we, we really have something um, that really just looks like a, a traditional, a tr traditional um, binary. Yeah, and, OK, cool. Uh, um, so what is, can you characterize what Python is today for the audience? Just, you know, yeah, I mean, it was so, this, it was that, it was semantic web. I mean, the, I mean, the bird's eye view is that it's really a replacement for your Python binary, right? So, I mean, in order to, to run Python programs, you say Python space, uh, phyname.py, uh, and, and that's, and that's the, the way you execute Python code. And um, uh, I mean, one way to view uh, sort of a black box view of PyPy is that you do the same thing, except instead of saying Python, you say PyPy space 
by name.py. And it should do exactly the same thing, sort of behaviorally. Um, any difference in behavior you observe is a bug, mm -hmm. um, apart from a few things that we couldn't quite match. But I mean, that's that's the basic idea. And uh, the only the main difference, sort of, from a purely um, black box point of view, is that it should uh, execute your Python programs a lot faster. And how it does that is complicated, but um, for, uh, from a user point of view, that that's really that's really how it works. But here's a question: if you if the if the number one goal is uh... <laughs> making it faster why is it implemented in python right uh yes so that, that's that's a great question um so uh, what i said earlier is, is I, mean, I was briefly talking about the analyzability right and yeah um, so we actually make use of that um, oh okay cool so in in we don't i mean we, we probably won't cover uh, all that much of, of how that works today but um we, we didn't really write a jit Instead, mm -hmm. we, wrote, we wrote a kind of meta JIT, and the meta JIT is <laughs> a lot <parametrized>. of JIT. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's that is parameterized by an interpreter. Okay. So um, we have a JIT that you that you can sort of you, you you write an interpreter in R Python, and then you plug in this weird component which is called the meta JIT, and the meta JIT yeah. will turn the interpreter into a JIT compiler. Wait, but that's now, nuts. Now we're taking we're now we're taking off a bit too much, I feel. Yeah, no, this is um, I mean, this is super interesting because because I feel like you know my intuition is like okay, cool, having like a meta jet and having like a parameterized interpreter that all sounds like really nice academic stuff, but I don't believe that would make it faster. So I think the fact <laughs> the fact right. that it actually makes it faster is crazy. I'm right. flagging it. We need to re revisit this after you do your demos because because I think that you know this is something that's like. I don't. I've never seen it before. Maybe I haven't seen enough things, but I, I think we should we sh we should dive, dive in a little bit and, and start somewhat. Yeah, slowly yeah. Let's and, let's and, dive in and then uh, let's let's come back to um, this. Let's start yeah. somewhat more slowly than what we that we tried <laughs> uh, what we talked about the last minute. Yeah, uh, right. I am. Uh, I was talking so much that my keyboard uh, key disappeared. Okay, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, I'm. Oh, also one one more uh, request from Hong Yi last time was to talk more about like what is Python? How does a programming language person characterize you know the beast that is Python? If we have an animal where like it has four legs, two eyes, like what is Python? So as you go, if you can just you know, yeah, I, I, I mean I think that that's too that's a bit too philosophical for me, but I mean, <laughs> that's, but yeah, let, let's talk about it a little bit. Let's actually start really simply with with some some tiny python code uh, is that is the font size kind of okay um it's good for me but people should comment let me see um you could probably do it a little bit bigger i don't know how small other people's screens are someone said it's okay uh, i'm not actually going to show tons of code so um okay right uh let's let's sort of uh start with some really simple python code right um, we, we just have a global and it's set to five, and then we have a function that takes two parameters x and y, and then we just do a little bit of arithmetic in here. Right? And um, then you can um, you can uh, start an interactive session with that. And then you have that function here, um, and then of course you can call it. You can say uh, three uh, is thirteen, and it's thirteen because uh, two plus uh, three times two is um, plus five is thirteen. Okay, but how does it actually do that, right? Um, and I mean, it looks so simple, right? But um, what it does is, is pretty complicated. And um, the first step, the first layer, and um, unless I say otherwise, uh, the first layer is completely identical to CPython, right? I mean, I'm really um, explaining how Python execution works um, quite generally. And actually, I, I started CPython here. I didn't start PyPy or, or anything uh, magic. and um, the first thing that CPython actually does is it will it will sort of parse this file and uh, lex this file, parse this file, and then turn uh, all the code in here, including the, the function, into bytecode. And, and, and that's pretty similar to how the JVM, the Java VM, does it. Mm, bytecode is basically an instruction set for sort of a, um, a fictional machine um, that uh, is tuned to, um, to executing Python code. Mm, and one thing we can do is we can actually look at the, uh, at the bytecode for this function. So we can import the disassembly um, a module and say, please disassemble uh, f into mm, its bytecode. And then we get this uh, more or less helpful uh, output here. And um, 
and, and those are the bytecodes of the function. And, and um, the, the, the virtual machine is basically a stack-based uh, stack virtual machine. So all the operations sort of operate on the stack. And we start by, I mean, to, um, to execute x plus y times two, we, we start by pushing stuff on the stack. First, we push uh, x on the stack, then we push y on the stack, then we um, push a constant two on the stack, and then we uh, multiply the two uh, stack elements, which is y times two, push the result on the stack, stack and then do add to add x, and then we load a global uh, glob, uh, and then we do another add, and then we return that. And in order to run this thing, um, there is basically um, some a C emulator for this instruction set, which is uh, which is the interpreter, because I mean when most people say interpreter, they don't really um, also say that there is already a uh, one step of compilation here, right? Um, nobody actually interprets the the, the the strings of the source code because that would be way too uh, inefficient. I mean um, almost all languages have some kind of um, pre-analysis step and turn the source code either into something like an AST or um, turn it into like some bytecode like Python and Java are doing, and then you run that. And the reason for that is that you don't want to uh, analyze the strings of the function every time that you, um, that you want to run this function, right? So there's already one level of compilation going on, which is to the bytecode. But of course the bytecode is, is operating on a really high level. And, um, and yeah, we 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 should uh, we should actually talk a little bit about uh, the complicated things that are going on here, um, and we can talk about it in the following way. Um, we can make this function do vastly. I mean, this function looks small and, and harmless, right? But we can make it do very different things. By for example, we can say, uh, let's call it with another type, which is a float, right? um, of course, um, and then it returns a float. Or we can uh, we can turn it, uh, we can run it with a really long number. Uh, and then it will have to use a very different number representation. Actually, I was starting Python 2, where you can see that it's a different type by BL. And with Python 3, it's, it's harder to distinguish these two types. Uh, you can also call it with like uh, complex numbers um, or decimals or rationals or whatever. And you can also do very weird thing things and say, okay, let's, let's set the global to a string. And then we can call it with strings, right? Uh, so that. Um, right. So um, these bytecodes do a lot of work. <laughs> they don't just uh, a binary multiply is not just an integer multiplication. It's really uh, I need to analyze the types that I'm given and then do very complicated things based on those types. And and that's even customizable. I can go and define my own uh, types that override. Uh, what uh, plus and, multi uh, and multiplication operators do, and then this function will do basically anything. I mean, even I mean, even though it looks cute and harmless, um, you can you can make this function compute anything uh, by passing in weird by passing in weird arguments here. And and that's also that's also I mean the reason why it's very hard to make Python efficient because. Um, if you, I mean, if you give the a compiler the job to turn this function here into a, an efficient machine code somehow, you cannot give, I mean, without sort of more information, you, there is really no way to turn this into efficient code. What you can do is you can sort of turn the, the multiply here into a call to a helper function that does the multiplication and the plus into a call to a helper function that does the, that does the plus, but um, that will not be efficient because the, um, the multiply does this very complicated analysis of uh, what are the types, what sh uh, what should what should the multiply actually do, right? and um, and that's that's kind of the that's kind of the difficulty of um, of Python, and that's also I mean that's something that I stress uh, very often is that Python looks like a clean and, and harmless. I mean I think Joe also said that it looks like a clean and harmless uh, language uh, of like. From a high level point of view, but it's really not. It's, I mean, um, every, I mean, in from my point of view, it's a it's a really amazing feat that they managed to design a language that looks really simple and it's sort of the favorite language of beginners. But then all the details are very complicated, <laughs> and um, right. Um, so here's an interesting and um, I think controversial question. 
If the types are available at compile time, it should be doable though. Haha. -ha. Um, maybe. I mean, if the types are uh, available and the types are sort of simple types like strings and ints and floats, that may be true. But um, for like, even if you knew that a x is an instance of this specific user-defined class over there, that's that's still not enough because you can change the methods of classes at runtime. And then the fact that the um, that you know that it's an instance of a doesn't really help you if you can't be sure what um, the concrete uh, um, method actually is. So I mean, you let, let me make them more concrete. Uh, we can define our our own class a, right? And um, we can say it has an add method. It's uh, another thing, and it always returns uh, forty one. Okay. And then it has a mole method, self, other, and that always returns 13 and 12, whatever. And then if you, you can call the function with uh, two of these a's, what, I mean, I mean, even mentally figuring out what, what it does is, is hard. Ah, it doesn't work, damn. Ah, yes, because glob is still, uh, uh, is still a string. Let's turn it back into an int. Right, and then you get a number out, which may or may not be what you want. But uh, now, even if I know that f takes two a's, I cannot compile it to good code. Why? Because at runtime, somebody can say, oh, uh, I, I now please give me another uh, method implementation. And now I want it to, to return 35. Right? And then f will behave differently. So, um, so that's actually, but I mean, I still think it's a fantastic question because that's actually one of the main approaches um, of various projects to, uh, that want to compile Python. Um, and, and including our Python. Um, so one way to actually compile stuff to efficient code is that you restrict your language. You say, oh, you need to give me types and you need to promise not to do all the weird dynamic stuff that, that's possible, right? And, and, and that way you sort of reduce the things that the programmer is allowed to do. But if you do that redu reduction, then you can go and produce um, efficient um, machine code from, from your program. And, and that's certainly a valid strategy. And it's definitely a strategy that, that various projects uh, have taken. And um, as I said, R Python is one of them. And then there's also Scython, which is like a sort of uh, Python syntax on, on C semantics um, with C-like types. And that can be compiled to C code. Um, and then there's stuff like uh, Numba, which is a JIT for uh, sort of numeric code that, that does quite well for uh, NumPy arrays. And that also has the property that um, all the dynamic stuff is forbidden. And if you do it, then it's a bit unclear whether it, it, it will just give the wrong result or uh, it crashes or, um, I mean, I, I didn't really study that. But that's certainly, I mean, a very popular approach um, when it comes to sort of thinking up a way of, of executing Python more efficiently. Right, okay, so now I <laughs> managed to have a screen full of, of scary looking corner cases. Um, uh, yeah, let's actually, um, rest yeah, let's restart the session. And um, <laughs> we, were, we were saying um, that, uh, okay, um, this is what Python does. I mean, it executes this bytecode to run the function. And um, for, uh, for numbers, it's, it's actually relatively understandable what, what happens. We, we do this stuff and then multiply will multiply the numbers and add will add the numbers and there's another add. And, and so it's not that hard. So for numbers, you can sort of kind of see the shape of the machine code that you would like to generate. And the question is that is only how do you, how do, you do that? Um, Right. Um, there's another question. Can the use of the wackiness be detected to hot path the standard case? Right. Uh, and I think that's again the, that's again the right question. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I mean, not, not, I'm not saying it's easy, but uh, basically the way that you, um, that you make Python fast and, and if you don't want to change the language semantics and, and that's actually what, what Pepper is doing, um, you need to sort of constrain the wackiness, right? And you do that not by doing static analysis because that's hopeless, right? Uh, it's, completely, it's completely impossible to um, sort of detect 
statically ahead of runtime uh, whether any wackiness occurs in, in your program. But it's certainly possible to, to notice at compile time, uh, at runtime. And at runtime, you can do stuff like, um, I want to make sure that no wackiness occurs here. And that means I install all kinds of sort of watchers that make sure that uh, no, no wackiness has happened. And then as long as uh, those watchers never trigger, I can sort of stay on the hot path. I can stay on the path that uh, executes stuff really efficiently by assuming, oh, the numbers are type, uh, and the arguments of that function are um, type constant. And uh, so I've, I've seen, let's say, I've seen calls to that function that take two ints. So I assume that all future calls also uh, take two ints. And I assume that nobody has overwritten that, that, that global. And um, I can sort of bake in those assumptions and then I can uh, turn F into really uh, efficient machine code. And um, that's really the core uh, technology for all kinds of JIT compilers. Um, you really need to, uh, you need really to restrict your dynamism by observing bad stuff happening at runtime. And um, as long as bad stuff doesn't happen, you stay on the hot path, you stay on the, on the fast path, which usually means sort of very, very good machine code that you made. And uh, as long as nothing dramatic and, and weird happens, um, you can just keep running the machine code. And then only if somebody goes and like overrides the globals or um, changes classes or um, like adds methods or, or what, what other, I mean, redefines F, you can also just go and, and say F is now some other function, right? Um, and as long as none of that happens, you will stay on the hot path and stuff is fast. And the cool thing is that you can, the, the, I mean, what you want to achieve is that the hot path doesn't really need checks. On the hot path, you don't really want the check, is F still the same? Because that costs your time, all those checks. Instead, you, you do um, basically, you, you observe all the writes uh, in your program. So every time somebody does a write to some a global, for example, if I redefine F um, to be return nine, and that is a write to the global F. So um, and I basically, I added some kind of watch point for that global F. And I said, when somebody touches F, please tell me, because I need to go and sort of throw out all kinds of machine code that, that operated under the assumption that F is still the previous function. And that means that um, executing the function is fast. Only writing to the, global, to the global name, that's what's slow, because that really has to go and sort of throw out all the affected code that now is no longer valid. But that's a good trade. I mean, that's that's the right trade-off to make because sort of overriding uh, existing globals is a rare is a relatively rare thing, right? You don't just, I mean, hopefully you you don't just add lots of methods uh, to your classes all the time. I mean, maybe you do it a little bit at like at, when you when you start and when you import and then you maybe you have some meta programming. That's fine. But then it, there should be really a point where you stop doing the wackiness, and then from then on, doing more wackiness starts to become expensive. Um, right. cool. that, yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's how Piper, the Piper JIT works. And that's how all the JIT works. That's also how like V8 works or, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, all, all the good expensive JITs uh, do that. Even, even, even hotspot. I mean, in, in Java, you can do less wacky stuff, but you can always do stuff like, oh, I, I load another class and that class uh, is subclassing another class that I so far um, assumed doesn't have subclasses. And then I need to go and throw out all the code that has that baked in the assumption that that, uh, that class was final so far. So so even in Java, you you can do enough dynamic stuff that you need this kind of computation approach. Um, cool. No, that's a that's a really great answer, and um, it's really nice, nicely high level, and I think it's a nice segue into what the heck is a JIT. Uh, how does how does right. PyPy actually make things faster? <laughs> uh, actually, I want to. I'm going to uh, evade the question for another two minutes. Um, I mean, I actually want to. I, I want to start PyPy now, right? And actually, let me let me start PyPy three because I should have started Python uh, three two, but I was mistyping. So um, as I promised, um, PyPy three really looks like um, the Python executable that we were looking at earlier. And if I run the same examples, I get the resu same results, and it has the same bytecode, right? So I can disassemble stuff, and, and we really get the same thing out. And so 
um, to start with, the interpreter works exactly like um, C Python. So the behavior is really identical. And then only in a later step, um, there is a component that, that's, uh, that's called the JIT compiler that will sort of observe that you're doing stuff repeatedly. And um, it, in particular, it observes loops. And it will say, for, for every loop in your program, it will actually maintain a counter how often you've, uh, you've been running that loop. And then um, after a while, it, it maybe identifies loops that have been running uh, like a thousand times. So the, um, the runtime profiler deduces that this seems to be an important piece of your program. And then it deduces that it might make sense to turn this, uh, this loop into machine code. And it will do that, and it will do that uh, by observing all the types that you're running at that, that you're using in that loop at that point, right? So it will, it will make machine code, but it will make, make machine code that, that has a lot of assumptions. And the, all, the, um, all those assumptions are based on the concrete runtime behavior of your program. And that's, I mean, that's the superpower that the JIT has. The JIT, uh, I mean, a static compiler looks at this function and has no clue because it doesn't know what the types are. But the JIT compiler, it can always cheat. Uh, and that's, I mean, the, the reason why JITs are good is because they cheat. It's not, they don't, they're not really magic. Um, they, they can just, I mean, they have available to, uh, they have um, the runtime values of the program available and they can sort of use those runtime values to, um, to make better code. And what they typically do is that they say, okay, I've seen, um, I've seen you call F with int and int a lot. So I assume it will always be called with int and int, which I mean, that might be wrong later. But it's a, it's a good starting assumption. And then uh, I'm, I'm going to go and make um, a good um, machine code version of that function um, under the assumption that x and y are ints and that glob is five. And um, as long as none of these assumptions changes, we can keep using that machine code. And if the assumption later, um, if the assumption later turns out to be wrong, then I need to throw out that machine code and make new ones for the new assumption. Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily need to throw out the existing machine code. Sometimes I have many variants of the same function in machine code at the same time. I might have one for ints and one for floats and one for really big ints that don't fit into a machine word anymore and so on. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in a way, I, the way I would characterize JIT compilers is it's, I mean, it's a, it's a static compiler that cheats by looking at what your program does um, concretely at runtime, and in that way, it it doesn't have to uh, it doesn't have to work so hard. It doesn't have to do complicated static global analysis that take long and are sometimes wrong. Um, instead, it it really it it just looks, and that's um, that's really how it works. So there are a couple of questions for you. One, is, I'll I'll give you them one at a time. Uh, mm -hmm. The first is, what is a type for the JIT? For example, does it distinguish list of A's and list of B's? Ah, that's a very, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, so, so I think the question is, what kind of properties of the runtime can the JIT bake in when sort of making good assembler? And, and um, indeed, that's sort of the most active area of research, uh, or I mean, research and also just work uh, in in all in all the JITs uh, to sort of bake in new interesting assumptions. Uh, and we we touched on a view uh, on a few already, right? I mean, it can definitely take the types of the arguments here, but it can also, uh, and, and that's a good question. Um, it can also uh, distinguish between lists that are uh, all integers and all floats. Um, and the reason for that is that internally lists of integers um, are represented differently, right? So um, if, you, if you really make a list, I mean, we, we didn't talk about lists yet, but Python has lists. If you make a list, then PyPy will observe that, oh, it's a list that's homogeneous in what it stores. And then it will pick a more efficient representation of this data structure that's uh, based on the assumption that it's, oh, it's all, uh, it's all integers. And then if you add another type, you need to throw, throw out that assumption and mutate the way that the list is stored. But um, it, uh, that means it can definitely uh, sort of optimize a function that will um, operate on such a list to uh, make use of the fact that the list really only contains ints. Um, and there are all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, we, we, also, we briefly talked about the global. I mean, one problem is that 
uh, globals in Python are really a dictionary, right? So you can call this function, and then you really get a dictionary here. And it's a completely, it, from the Python point of view, it's a completely regular dictionary that you can touch and mutate and do strange stuff to. But you still want to uh, optimize your code uh, depending on uh, concrete values in the dictionary. Because, I mean, the lookup of the global here, glob, you really want to uh, know that glob is five here in order to uh, write, uh, in order to, op to, to optimize the function. And uh, that means that dictionary is represented very differently than a normal dictionary. It's really a special kind of dictionary representation used for globals only. And um, that uh, is particularly important because we need to watch, uh, we need to watch that global dictionary for mutations. So um, when, uh, if we actually made a nice code out of F, we, we will have to watch this dictionary for changes to glob. Because if glob changes, we might have to throw away the machine code that we made for uh, f already. And, and if, if we change the, the global f, that the same is true, of course. And there are all kinds of stuff like that. For example, um, maybe some people have heard of hidden classes in, in V8, or they're sometimes called maps. Uh, it's actually a, a pretty old um, optimization that, that comes from self, which is this research um, variant of Smalltalk. And uh, uh, Python and, and also JavaScript has a really bad problem with instances, because if you make a class, you don't actually uh, say anywhere uh, what the fields of that class are, right? So you can make an instance of that and another instance of that, and you can give these instances completely different fields. And A2 has a also field X, but then also a field Y, right? Just because. And that means if you actually compile code that accesses such a field, you have a problem because uh, naively this this dictionary is uh, this thing is again represented as a dictionary. I mean, Python is really dictionaries all the way down, mm. and that means for that dictionary we also need to pick a very different representation based on the assumption that most people will actually have well-behaved classes that. Uh, have a constructor that just always assigns the same instance fields. You cannot rely on it. I mean, you need to be prepared for somebody doing weird stuff like that. But in the in the case where people write well-behaved classes, you really want to uh, make the optimization uh, use this uh, property uh, to produce good code. Right? So that's another kind of type-like thing that the JIT can use to um, to produce better code. Uh, so there are a lot of things that that are not really I mean, they're not really types in a static typing kind of sense. They're more sort of global properties of, of the program. Cool. So someone asked, um, the, how is jitting related to profile guided optimization? And then um, I would like us to get back to the question of how is it possible that <laughs> PyPy is, um, is so fast when it's written in Python and doing all this crazy stuff? Right. Okay, uh, let's start with profile. I mean, it's basically profile guided, and um, that's that's a great comparison. It's it's profile guided optimization on steroids. Um, it's yeah. I mean, so classical profile guided optimization in uh, C compilers is relatively limited. It usually um, mainly gets um, information about which of the code paths are executed uh, how often, and in in a JIT you can really you get a lot more information from um, from the runtime. But the basic idea is the same. You, you get information from uh, the runtime in order to sort of help your compiler to make better code. Right? Um, yeah. And um, Gina, I, I fear you need to uh, tell me your question again. Actually, oh, yeah. no, well, so, no, wait, well, stop. I, uh, I will, I, I, let, let me do the cool demo. I okay, mean, yeah, let's do the cool demo, which might answer this question. <laughs> No, but uh, let's do it maybe. <laughs> it's cool. Um, so the cool demo. I mean, one problem with demos is that they're extremely boring. I said that running PyPy Py Py, uh, and uh, Python uh, does the same thing, right? So I do the same thing twice, and oh, uh, one looks a bit faster than the other. So that that's very boring. Um, so what we started doing at some point is we started doing uh, video, uh, real-time video processing mm. to sort of really drive home the difference. And, and so what I, what I did here, unfortunately it's written in, in Python 2, but what I did here is, this is a very simple edge detection algorithm 
in like a screen full of Python code. And if I run this with, um, with C Python, it takes ages um, to, to get the first frame, right? Um, I, actually, I hope it works because I, I have this two webcam set up. Usually I give this demo live, not really over Zoom. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see, see whether it does something. Actually, why we wait, we can look at the source code. Um, I don't know, wait, that's the C version. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, uh, ah, that, we have a frame, one frame, right? Very good. And then, but it's, it doesn't look very live, right? I think, I, I think the, the units to, to tell us how slow it is, is, is seconds per frame, not frame per, frames per second. And so I'm going to, I'm going to stop that. Uh, and actually the, the frame per second computation is wrong. It gives me a negative number. Um, which, <laughs> so um, slow. slow. You have to give it frames per second. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. And then uh, of course, if you, I mean, that, that, I mean, that was to be expected, but that's the point of the demo is that if, if I run, run the same thing with PyPy, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not really fast, but uh, it's Amazing. much faster and you get the Definitely edges. Definitely it's giving can, you frames. It's giving you frames. <laughs> Right, and now you also find, found out why I'm wearing a striped shirt tonight, right? Because I want oh. lots of edges to detect. Um, <laughs> oh. Right. Um, okay, it's it's still not super fast, but um, no, yeah. that's a cool demo. I am. Um, I wasn't sure why you were practicing the the edge detection, but now it all makes sense. <laughs> that's really, uh, really cool. Right. I have um, one. Um, let me actually do this one. This one is really fun. And you got some questions during this time. Um, yes. Someone asked whether PyPy can run itself. Yep, it can. I mean, it's it's getting a little bit more complicated nowadays because okay, this doesn't work. I don't know why. Uh, it's getting a little bit more complicated nowadays. I broke something. So uh, you, get, you only get one video processing demo. Uh, because uh, I told you that um, we mainly work on PyPy 3 nowadays, and PyPy is written in, in a subset of Python 2. So you cannot easily do, I mean, this, right? Um, but we, we also still maintain um, uh, a Python 2 implementation, and with that, you can absolutely uh, uh, run itself. But that's not fast, right? Because in that way, it's really just running as a, as a regular, non bootstrap, non type inference uh, Python program. And it and it will be uh, quite slow. Um, it also, I mean, in that form, it also doesn't have a JIT because the JIT really, the JIT is really a, a very complicated transformation that you can apply only after uh, turning, I mean, while turning stuff into C code, you will actually sort of transform the JIT in, and so you cannot get the JIT while you're running as a Python program because the JIT really needs to analyze the interpreter and understand the structure of the interpreter in order to to really work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That um, makes sense. Um, this is related to another question from the audience. How do JITs actually do the profiling without slowing things way down? I mean, they slow down, they don't slow down a little bit, but um, Python is quite slow, so you don't really notice. Um, so the, the basic idea is that if you, I mean, I've been saying that a couple of times now, but um, Python really focuses on loops. And so the profiling, um, I mean, as it's at, at its simplest, will really have one counter per loop. And that means per loop iteration, you increment that counter. And then if the counter goes over a threshold, you start compiling that loop. And that's the basic idea. But then basically maintaining, maintaining one counter every 17 bytecodes that, that make the loop body is not that expensive, given that every bytecode is, is um, I mean, every bytecode in Python can be very complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have another one uh, for every function call that means if you have very recursive code and no loops at all, you, you still want to compile stuff. But um, function call, um, calls in Python are also very slow, so um, it, it doesn't really matter that much. And then when you start compiling, then of course stuff gets briefly quite a bit slower. For like one iteration, it's going to be very slow. But then um, the next iteration of your loop, you, you already execute um, the, uh, the newly produced machine code, and, and then, you're, then you're good again. Um. um cool 
So um, I will ask a different question because uh, you keep on uh, putting off my question. Maybe this is a better, sorry, sorry. better question to ask. No, 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 no. But I think maybe, maybe this is a better question to ask. How does the implementation of PyPy, uh, PyPy compare to implementations of other JITs in Python and um, other JITs for other languages? Because maybe that will shed some light on this uh, answer I'm trying to get. Uh, OK. So. Okay, let me first compare it to, I mean, there aren't actually that many other Python JITs, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not really aware of many live ones. There is this one called, um, what's it called? Pi something that came out of Dropbox, but that doesn't at the moment seem to produce machine code at runtime. It's that it, 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 instead of it, uh, that it rewrites it, its own bytecode to be more efficient. Um, and then the other main competitor is, is, is something called Truffle Python, which is, uh, by Oracle, um, which also has used this kind of meta approach. Um, they're also writing an interpreter and then have a meta JIT framework um, to, to produce machine code in, in this sort of indirect way. Um, so that might not actually, uh, I mean, it might not be that uh, helpful to compare with that. Um, and then there, I mean, then there are the sort of the real VMs. I mean, in many ways, PyPy is not, is not really, um, a real VM. I mean, compared to the budget that something like Hotspot has, with, which took thousands of person years, and also V8, uh, V8 has like dozens of full-time engineers since many years, um, and and we, we have sort of a shoestring budget compared compared to that. And um, they are really done very differently. They're they're done um, in C plus um, plus for starters, and um, they're they're really done much more manually in some way. I mean, they, for them, they really need to go and sort of have a component that takes some JavaScript code and turns it into assembler. And we don't really have that component. Instead of we have, um, what we have instead is we have, we have this interpreter and we observe what the interpreter is doing. And then we turn what we observe into um, assembler. And that means all the semantics is really picked up by looking at um, at the at the Python bytecode implementation that, that we wrote in our Python. Um, well, um, someone asked, why did PyPy succeed when Unlead and Swallow, Piston, et cetera, or Piston maybe is pronounced. <coughs> Sorry, uh, I think it's Piston. I, I don't, I mean, I've only heard Piston so far. Um, um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think one component is really that we started from scratch. I mean, both Unlaid uh, and Swallow and, and also Piston um, started from CPython and they really wanted to um, make CPython fast, but that's hard because CPython is really this large C, uh, large and very old as we learned today, um, uh, C code base. And, um, and it's hard to sort of graft something next to that. And the other thing is that we gave up and that's something that's kind of still costing us uh, we gave up on the um, on the C extension support of CPython. So a lot of Python programs actually are part, I mean, even majority, uh, a major part of them is written in C, right? And it's actually C code that you uh, interact with by um, sort of binding it to a Python module. So you have a Python module that you can use and, and interact with, but the implementation is really not Python, but it's C. And a lot of Python programs actually work that way, that they have these, these large libraries that are written in C. And um, originally we gave up on being able to run these libraries, which um, made the, the first couple of years much simpler because, um, because uh, it sort of lets us throw away all this, this old leg legacy stuff that we didn't want to support. But of course, then eventually it turned out that people really use that stuff and, it, and it's hard to not have it. So we wrote an emulation uh, we wrote an emulation layer that now makes it possible for us to use these C written bi binaries in a, in a slightly slower way. Um, but I think the fact that we decided to really start from um, like what would be best from the JIT for the JIT and then only later thought about C um, level compat compatibility is really that one of the things that uh, distinguishes us from Unlaid and Swallow and Piston. And another thing that I think is really important that m a, a lot of people that want to write Python JITs don't get is that how important it is to really touch your, your data structures. We've, we've been talking about it a little bit, but um, 
the, the data structures that CPython uses are really not, they're really not in a shape to, to make good code out of them. And um, an example for that is really dictionaries. Uh, I mean, I mentioned that we have like many different ways to represent dictionaries and um, we represent them sort of based on which part of the language you're using them for. We have a very different dictionary implementation for global dictionaries and a very different dictionary implementation for instance dictionaries and so on. And you, that's really what you need to do. You need to have a very different dictionary for globals to make sure that you, you can compile away your global look, lookups. And none of the uh, other JITs ever did something like that. Um, and, and it's hard because it's, it's very annoying and hard to go into CPython uh, and rip out this very deeply ingrained dictionary implementation uh, that, that they're using and replace it with a very different one that still for the user behaves absolutely identical. And, um, and, and I think that's, that's also why we succeed is we, because we raised our implementation level to, to, to a language that, that's really much nicer to work with than C, um, we, we can do these complicated sort of uh, switching to different data structures that, that we're doing. Um, and yeah, I, I really think that's, that's something that um, the other projects aren't doing and something they also don't completely seem to understand. Um, cool. No, that's a great answer. And then we're actually to the end of time. Um, and I know it's midnight there, so I'll, I'll try to wrap up very soon. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy to talk a bit more. If, I mean, uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm... so there is one question about the meta JIT, which is how many lines of code is it? But I think it'd be really cool question. to just talk a little bit about the meta JIT before we, um, we end. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Okay, uh, let, let me actually go there. I, I, I don't really know. So it's 140,000 lines. Um, and so 60,000 of that are backends. So we have backends for like x86 and ARM and PowerPC and um, uh, some strange things. And then the main direct directory is this one. And I mean, tests, test lines are included in that number. So the, opti um, the optimization part is like 30,000 lines and then we have 22,000 lines of test. And, and the, the core of the meta JIT is, is like this number of lines. Um, I don't really know whether that's a lot. It's certainly not a lot compared to something like Hotspot, which is really gigantic. Um, but um, I mean, the reason why it's cool is that you really don't need to touch a lot of the components for even if you change your language, right? I mean, if you want to add a new, the, the reason why the meta JIT is fun is that um, when we went to Python 2 to Python 3, we, we didn't have to touch any part of the JIT really. I mean, the JIT is completely parameterized by the interpreter on top. And that means we had to change the interpreter to now run Python 3, which was very annoying and hard. But uh, then the, the JIT compilation out um, uh, was immediately able to produce machine code for uh, Python 3 without us touching the backends or the optimizations or anything. And that, I think that's really the reason why, there's another reason why we're still around, which is that, I mean, this property that you can change the interpreter and have the JIT pick up the changes of the language by looking at the interpreter, um, that's really one of our superpowers because it means we can keep up with the rapid ev evolution of Python. I mean, Python ch still changes a lot and it gets new features like every year. And um, if you every time have to sort of uh, touch your JIT compiler and sort of make your JIT compiler deal with all the new features, that, that would be very complicated. And, yeah, um, that's incredible. So if I'm understanding correctly, the fact that the meta JIT is there both um, helps you with the fact that the language is evolving quickly, but also um, helps you with the fact that you guys don't have an army of developers. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a good, that's a great characterization. Um, um, cool. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And so like, is it true that if you had like an army of developers, you could also make it the same amount of fast, uh, faster, but the meta JIT lets you do it um, with less work, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm usually joking, but it's, there's some truth to it. So the meta JIT gives us 80% of a good JIT for 20% of the effort. Yeah, that's and, awesome. Okay, and, cool. and I think that 80% is also important because I think if you had an army of people, you can probably make a much better Python JIT, right? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, or a little bit better if I didn't. I, I mean, I don't know. Nobody's done it. <laughs> please, some, please somebody find that army and give them 10 years. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Because it seems like, well, yeah, what's incredible to me is that I mean, it's, it sounds like Python, like PyPy is the fastest JIT for Python. And it's it's using stuff that, I mean, I, I'd always thought of as really good theoretical things, but it's not what you would apply to make the fastest thing. Um, so this right. is really, really cool. And it was a huge gamble. I mean, we didn't, I mean, when we started, we didn't know that. I mean, it was really research. and. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's also why we had these five JITs because we, um, <laughs> these five meta JITs, because I mean, we, we were for, for a very long time, we were really concretely trying to use partial evaluation, which uh, I think the chat has, chat has mentioned. But um, um, yeah, so like a quick follow up question to that is like, what is it about Python that you think requires the meta JIT? So if someone were trying to meta JIT JavaScript or something like that, like, would, would they get the same benefits? So could you have like V7? Let's <laughs> just manage it in slightly slower. Um, I mean, we ha we used to have a bad JavaScript. So I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly theoretically possible, but I, I mean, I think for JavaScript completely, it's not that useful in practice because I mean, JavaScript is really very closely tied to browsers. Yeah. And then sort of, I mean, you wouldn't, I mean, doing the browser implementation is, um, is not that, it's not that easy. Um, yeah. So So, and the other thing is that, I mean, one thing that is JavaScript JITs feel very acutely, which is not true for Java and also not completely true for Python, um, is that you need to be very fast at JIT compilation, right? Mm. I mean, because you really, you, you get the code and you, you load the page and you want to see something immediately, right? You don't want to uh -huh, uh -huh. spend ages. So the, the JavaScript JITs are really working very hard at um, making the JIT compiler itself have many different um, levels of compilation, for example. They start with an interpreter and then they have a slightly better JIT and then a slightly mm -hmm, better JIT. Mm -hmm. and, and I think most of them are at like three or four levels by now. I see, mm -hmm. I see. Um, so with with the PyPy meta JIT, you kind of like, it takes some boot up time, um, but then it's it's fast right. after that. I mean, it's, it's not actually that terrible. I mean, it's, I mean, you can see it here, right? If you, yeah, if you go yeah. Back to the demo, um, you can see that, I'm not sure that it works or whether I broke it. But you, you can see that the first frames are not that fast, right? And yeah, yep, it stabilizes yep. at something higher. Huh, that's um, really cool. Right. So, like, do people use PyPy in production? Like, what, who uses it? <laughs> I mean, so, so there are various answers to that. I mean, to a first order of approximation, the answer is probably no one. Um, then, but, which is not completely true because we, ha we have gotten real funding by real companies that use it. A lot of them don't want to be named. Um, <laughs> and yeah, for example, we, we have serious users in the sort of space like high frequency trading, where they really mm -hmm. uh, use it as a competitive advantage oh, uh, and don't want everybody else to know. And, I see, I see, interesting. And then there's also what I, what I recently learned Apparently, there's a huge community of something like uh, called competitive programming, which is are these websites where you get these puzzles and you need to solve them quickly. And oh. your, your programs, your programs also need to run quickly; otherwise, you you won't get into the leaderboards. And apparently, PyPy is really big there, which I'm, which I'm not sure is is good or does it mean something. But uh, I, I was very interested in learning that. Um, Right. But, but you would think that if your per I guess if your programs had to run quickly, I was gonna say you'd think you'd write in like OCaml or something in the very least. But um but I guess like it's it's fast to write Python. So right. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Right. Huh, that's cool. Um cool. So we are over time, so I will wrap up, but um Carl Friedrich, is there anything final you would like to say? Are there like ways that if people want to know more where they can read or get involved? I mean, so it's a, I mean, I, I definitely want to say that if you want to hack on, on languages, then it's definitely a very approachable project because in, I mean, definitely if you know Python, in, in the end it's really just Python code and you, you can really, you can unit test it as Python code and you can sort of use your Python debugger to step through it. I mean, I mean, sort of the, the very original goals of, of, of being um, actually, Again. Uh, the very original goals of being sort of understandable and approachable as a as a as a Python project are still there. Um, so it's definitely an easy project to get into, and we also 
uh, I mean, the, the community is, is relatively nice and, and we will help people out. Um, so yeah, if, if you wanna do your favorite Python feature, then, then heck on stuff. It's, uh, uh, it's also, I mean, even the JIT is quite approachable in some ways. I mean, JITs are never completely approachable, right? Uh, but um, given that we really decouple all these, these layers, um, you can, I mean, the JITs are also nicely unit tested. You can go and say, I have this optimization. What does it do? Well, here's the unit test. You have this code and you want to turn it into this code. And if that doesn't happen, then your unit test fails. And if you want to make a new optimization, then, well, you add a unit test that says, Here's the code that I want to optimize, and that's what it should become. And then you run it, then it fails, and then you add a new optimization. Right? So uh, it's really it's a it's a relatively approachable real world virtual machine, which um, is yeah. I mean, how it's it's possible that I'm uh, mischaracterizing this uh, after having been uh, gotten used to that stuff for many years, but um, we we have people that just show up and do things. So it, it I think it's partly partly really true yeah and um, i think yeah this is a, a great um i think this is great especially for the pl talk mission because one of the things that i want people to come away with is this understanding that compilers and interpreters and jits are just like software like anything else right. and i think the fact that this is so approachable is um is a really yeah. nice yeah, and the other thing you i mean if you're interested in want me watch to do that kind of stuff i i have a uh, I have a Twitch where I live code um, occasionally on Saturday evenings. Yeah, uh, wait, my, what's your Twitch handle? I'll put it into here. Um, PyPy Project. Mm. Uh, mm. Cool. I just, I just said, hey. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, and um, I, actually, let's, let's do it. Um, I mean, I think we can officially end and then, then I will do some unofficial uh, code looking for five more minutes if you want. Um, oh, well, do you want to do it? People can meet you over at PyPy Project. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm staying here and I will show you that it's just Python code. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. So I mean, we will add. If, if that's okay with you. I mean, if you're. Yeah, yeah. Out of time, it's then... No, it's, it's absolutely okay. I do have to run in like uh, 10 minutes, but then, okay, um, but we can do I, I it. Um, but yeah. Okay. So I am. Um, so so yeah, I will say my ending part, the official ending okay, part, so ending which part. is that um, next week we have. Uh, Rob O'Callaghan on with us. We're going to talk about um, uh, record and replay debugging uh, or time travel debugging, um, which is which is very cool. So Rob um, architected the RR debugger at Mozilla. He's working on Pernasco right now, but you know he is uh, a world expert on time travel debugging. And uh, I believe Coding Fiend in the audience also is very into time travel debugging. So next week, do not miss it. Um, Rob is calling in from New Zealand, so it's going to be the biggest time difference yet. Um, it's the next day over there, so um, it's very exciting. And then, uh, yeah, we have many, many more cool episodes coming up. I'm going to drop the GitHub link for the schedule into the chat. There's also a Discord. You can join us there. So Carl Friedrich is in the Discord. You can ask him questions on the Stream of the Week channel. You can ask Rob, uh, you know, preview questions on the Stream of the Week channel. But um, yeah, very, very exciting times. And then now we'll have an unofficial, uh, uh, what's it called, encore. <laughs> an encore. Um, I mean, the, the thing that I want to say is that, I mean, we've been talking about these bytecodes, right? Um, uh, let me actually get them up again. Um, right, and what I want to concretely do is I, I want to show you one of the implementations of these bytecodes, right? And it's, it and convince you that it's really just Python code. And um, so we have this file called pyopcode, and that's really just um, uh, an implementation of all these uh, opcodes that Python uh, has as methods of some class. And um, here's the load fast one, and it gets some arguments. It, it gets the index of the variable, which you can see here, zero. And that index corresponds to the x variable. And then what it does is it will read at the at the var index from some list, and that's really just a Python list. Um, that is an, an instance field of, of self, and self is a is a frame. It's it's an object that represents um, basically a, a Python frame. And then you get a value out, and the w prefix means that it's um, a Python object, something that the user understands as an object. And then we will push that right because lowfast uh, takes a variable and pushes it on the stack. And then push value is implemented somehow to, to push stuff on some stack. 
And, and you can go uh, and look at like, what does the class look like that we're in? We're in this Python class. And okay, it has some complicated fields here, but one of the things that you can find is that, uh, what's the instance variable called local self stack. Um, you can look at the uh, initialization of that list, which is just really a list of nuns uh, of a certain size. And, and um, the other thing you can do is you can look at where does, where's the load fast um, bytecode implementation actually called? And then you find the bytecode dispatch loop, right? It's really just a, a, a huge while loop here, quite true. This function is uh, maybe not surprisingly called dispatch bytecode and uh, quite true. And then you have a big switch and a switch in Python is unfortunately just the list of ifs. So if the opcode is that, if the opcode is that, blah, blah, blah. And then at some point you have the load fast bytecode. And uh, if the opcode is the load fast bytecode, then you call that method. Uh, and of course, the, the list of ifs is turned into a switch in C because otherwise it would be very inefficient. But um, the, that's, the basic, uh, that's the basic structure. And if you want to debug it, then you just put uh, a PDB in here and you say, okay, start the debugger and start the trace function. And then you have a breakpoint here and can step through it and see what it does. And um, yeah, and, and, and that's, 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 that's why it's fun to work on it. And um, yeah, if you write a test, you will write some Python code and it will run on this thing very slowly. But uh, in order to find out what's going wrong, you can really go here and, um, uh, and then um, you, um, you can use all the Python tools in the book. You can use fuzzer uh, like um, property-based testing and, and coverage and, and everything. Um, yeah, so it's just Python. And if you like Python, then, um, then it's definitely a, a nice way to get started uh, understanding um, about how inter uh, interpreters work. Um, right. Uh, oh, by the way, speaking of time travel debugging, uh, we also have a time travel debugger in PyPy. Uh, for Python, and it, it, it uh, works exactly like RR works. So, um, right. Um, right, and the, the final thing, and I think then we're done, is we were talking about running um, PyPy as a py Python program, and um, that's what I've, I'm doing in this uh, uh, tab of my shell. Here we're running um, really PyPy as a, as a Python file. And that's very, very slow, right? So even if you add stuff, it takes a perceptible amount of time to finish because um, it needs to parse stuff and then um, uh, very slowly execute all the computing machinery and, it, and it's, it's super slow. But uh, it's still very fun to play around with. In particular, it's fun to play around with because you can, you can drop down one level and say, okay, I have this Python object. What does it look like on the implementation level? So if you have a, if you have a number, you can say, I want to drop down one level uh, with control C, and then you really one level down and you can say, okay, what is this X? How is it represented in, uh, in the interpreter? And then you can see that it's an instance of some class um, called uh, int object. And um, the int object has some kind of field like int val maybe that stores the actual number. And it has all, uh, it has all kinds of methods. Mm. And so, so that's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really using it super often, but that's, that's a fun thing to do. You, that you can look at, the, at all your objects uh, from two different point of views. You can say, okay, I make a list. It, it, it has three ints, four ints. Uh, and then I'm dropping down one level. Uh, and what does the list look like here? And then I can see, okay, it's a list object and it uses a special strategy called the integer list strategies. And then it stores the numbers. And, um, and then you can say, okay, if I append something now that's not an int, ABC, and look, look again, then the list no longer uses the integer list strategy because it now has another kind of type of object stored. So it switched to the object list strategy. And now the content isn't just list, uh, it isn't just integers anymore. It's uh, instances of this int object class, four, four of them, and then a unicode object. Okay. And uh, I think with that, I'm done. Well, that's really awesome. Thank you for, for doing that last part. Yeah, I think this is like seeing it in Python is really, really nice because <laughs> I'm, 
I, I, I've, I'm looked into other, other compiler code bases to kind of do a deep dive and I've gone through them with Hung Yi and I'm like, oh yeah, let's look at the OCaml compiler. So easy, but mm -hmm. the code is really hard to read. Um, but this is, this is, this is really, really clean. Um, if people want to read through this themselves, what's the, what's the best place for them to look? I mean, so, so to get started looking at the interpreter, the, the right place is really, I mean, this is the checkout, right? It's called here, not the checkout. Oh yeah, I think and, someone commented on that. Right, and there's a there's a PyPy directory which is here is where all the interpreter stuff is, and there's there's the interpreter directory which contains the opcodes, um, here, and then there's the strangely named opspace standard directory which which contains all the built-in types. So there's mm -hmm. like bool, the bool type, yeah. and the bytes type, and um, the float type, and so on. Right? Cool. And then the third part, which is slightly less uh, common, is the module part. Which, and, and here we have all kinds of things that in, in C Python are written in, in C. Cool, awesome. Like the, yeah. the Swiss module, for example. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Carl Friedrich. This was, I'm, I know you're staying up very late to do this. No, so. it's all good. It's, I mean, this tomorrow is, I can sleep in. So. Yeah, this is very, very cool. And I think people are very excited. Um, and for everyone who's Thanks showing up just me. now, actually our, uh, our stream is, is ending now because we started one hour earlier. So sorry if you just showed up, but um, yeah, thank you again. And uh, everyone, I believe Carl Friedrich will be on the, on the Discord if you have any questions. And mm -hmm. we will see you next week for time travel debugging. Yep. Thanks a lot for inviting me and please uh, ask me stuff on Discord uh, or drop by in uh, the PyPy project stream. You ain't rich enough to hit the ladder of shit. Tell me when this is gonna be my face. Gonna be a shit. Gonna be a peace to the world. Let it rotate. Sex, money, murder, idea.